participating in this event, and, and I think what Sherry has put together is an outstanding panel of uh, researchers, authors, experts in these regions, and we hope that this is one of many that bring together the polar regions. It certainly is one that will uh, be replicated in terms of bringing expertise to bear on the work here at the Wilson, but also in response to the community, because in a lot of ways what Sherry has done here is a response to community interest in the polar regions. So with that, I want to turn it over to Sherry Goodman, who is a senior fellow in the Environmental Change and Security Program and in the Polar Initiative. And as many of you know, Sherry uh, is a former U.S. Deputy Undersecretary for Defense for Environmental Security. Her portfolio is uh, quite substantial, and we're very happy that she can bring to bear her expertise here at the Wilson Center and beyond. Sherry, thank you very much, and thank you to the panelists, and we'll look forward to questions and answers after the presentation. Sherry? Thank you very much, Mike. It's indeed a pleasure to work with you here at Wilson uh, and with the team of great folks at Wilson who helped bring this event together here today. Uh, so why are we here uh, on this morning where there is his, his historic breakthrough in what were previously glacial relations um, among North and South Korea? which overnight seem to have experienced their own icebreaker. <laughs> I want my children, if you ever listen to this, to know that your mother can actually be funny. <laughs> okay. Um, they probably won't agree with me. Um, but I think it was said best by the Secretary of the Navy uh, in his recent testimony to Congress. Why do you care about the Arctic? The damn thing melted. Okay. So, uh, we all know, because we work on these issues, that we deeply care about it and that the change is more rapid than anywhere else on the planet. The concept for today's event has been to bring together uh, the scholars uh, and forward-leaning thinkers who are breaking the ice in new scholarship uh, on the Arctic. And so I am very pleased that we have a very interesting panel. As many of you know, China issued its first Arctic, formal Arctic policy earlier this year. And Hong Nong, who is based here in Washington at the Institute for China American Studies and has a PhD from the University of Alberta in Canada, is a leading scholar and thinker on China's Arctic policy and other uh, matters concerning China's global relations. She's written, recently written an excellent paper, which I commend to you, and um, she's going to talk about what's new in, Ar in China's uh, Arctic policy. Why does it matter? Why do they care? What's happening? Um, second, I'm very, very pleased um, that we have Mark Rosen, who has been my colleague for many years at the Center for Naval Analysis. Mark Rosen is the Senior Vice President and General Counsel at CNA. Uh, a title I once held, actually. Uh, and, but Mark is also a captain, a uh, retired captain in the United States Navy, uh, has a deep expertise in international maritime law, and has been writing and thinking about maritime security and Arctic matters for a long time. And he, along with his colleague Kara Thuringer, who used to be an intern here at the Wilson Center, uh, have written a terrific piece about foreign direct investment in the Arctic. Uh, excellent piece of research, and uh, Mark is going to share the top lines of that today. I do commend it all to you um, uh, for your reading. And uh, we also have Mark Nevitt, another retired Navy officer who is now at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, also a naval aviator. And he, along with his colleague Robert Percival, have written a very, very interesting article I also commend to you about um, Arctic and Antarctic sort of polar law at the polar extremes, sort of a compare and contrast and kind of looking forward to evolutions, uh, particularly in, in the Arctic. And it's really an excellent, uh, excellent piece, and I'm looking forward uh, to Mark uh, hitting the top lines of his piece uh, this morning as well. And then we're, so each of them are going to speak for five to seven minutes. We'll have a bit of a discussion, and then we have two excellent discussions this morning. Uh, we are so fortunate to have here at the Wilson Center uh, Ambassador David Bolton, 
who is the nation's, really the nation's top diplomat on all things Arctic and oceans, and recently retired after um, more too many years of service. We all have many years of service at this point, uh, but he has continued his service and is continuing his service here at the Wilson Center, and we couldn't be more pleased to have him as he is beginning to think through the future of Arctic governance. Um, and um, last but not least, we have Lindsay Rodman, who is now an International Affairs Fellow with the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, based in Canada. She is also a Marine Corps uh, Reserve JAG officer. I don't know if I got all that order right, but <laughs> you get the idea. Uh, and she is also a lawyer. She worked in uh, Department of Defense uh, policy under in humanitarian in international humanitarian <laughs> policy. She's got a broad range of experience, and she uh, is now working closely with the Canadians uh, as they update their Arctic policy, which I think will also be of interest to you today. So, with that, Hong, I'm going to ask you if you would start. Uh, and give us the headlines from China's uh, Arctic policy, how it's evolving today. Um, what does it mean that China is now an Arctic stakeholder? And also, where, how do you think China's Arctic interests are going to evolve in the next five to ten years? Thank you, Sherry, for a very kind introduction. Thank you, Michael and Polo Institute for having me here today and giving me this very good opportunity to share with you my uh, the research which presented in the other report that Sherry just mentioned. And I think uh, in it's very interesting to look at China because in 2013, China together with Japan, South Korea, India, and Singapore were granted the status of observers in the Arctic Council, and South Korea and Japan have been very quick to issue the Arctic strategy or policy, and it took China four years to, in, uh, to come up with this most recent published white paper on the Arctic, uh, on China's Arctic interest. So honestly, the interest from China, it's not too much different from Japan or South Korea, given their very similar uh, uh, state interests in this region. So I think the white China's white paper is in a very positive. It has been uh, come out as a very careful deliberation and for the, from the Chinese policy makers. Uh, on the one hand, it actually uh, reflects that, uh, send a positive signal to the Chinese researchers and also policy practitioners who now have a clear guidance uh, in terms of uh, interest in, in this region. And it also reflects the long-standing expectation from researchers, from res uh, policy makers, within the country and also from other parts of the world who has been calling China to issue a clear strategy and to clear uh, to show more transparency on what is intention in the Arctic. So I believe that the timing is very mature. So my paper actually tried to summarize China's interest through several sessions. Uh, for instance, China's participate in the Arctic governance through multilateral regimes, and it tried very hard to promote bilateral relations with the Arctic states, not even the littoral state, not only the littoral state, but also other, like second polar states. And shipping is one of the most interesting uh, areas that China is looking into, and also resource the opportunity for resource development. And scientific research is one of the most important interests for China. And certainly uh, it's looking at how to uh, boost the recession gap and also how to promote uh, cooperation from the other states and non other states. So what I want to think out today, because my poll is too comprehensive, covering too much, I'm looking at the watch. So what I want to think out today is trying to uh, explain China as a non artist state, how to make sure that its activity and also engagement in this region will fall within the le international legal framework governing the Arctic, and also show how it's going to respect the domestic law from these Arctic states. So I think when we talk about legal issues in Arctic, there's too many on sovereignty, on jurisdiction, on maritime limitation, about the relationship between on cross the Law of the Convention as Barbara Treaty. So for China, because it's a non artist state, when it was graded the uh, state as observer and have to accept the uh, New York criteria, meaning that you have to respect the sovereignty and sovereign right of artist states. So there's no room for China to argue or make any uh, uh, position on the sovereignty and maritime dismission at all. So China's concern or 
looking to the, uh, the legal issues more reflected in its uh, interest, for instance, let's take shipping as one example. So half of China's GDP is depending on the shipping, so which means that it's eager to diversify its shipping uh, through uh, which trying to uh, reduce dependence on shipping through, for instance, Malacca Strait and for Suez Canal. So with the melting art in uh, with the melting ice in the Arctic, certainly give China and also like Japan and South Korea a very good chance in order to uh, benefit economically from sh shipping through the either Northwest Passage or Transpolar uh, Passage. So when we t can I can I show the next slides? Because when we're talking about like, China as a non arctic state, and actually when selling in the different in the different zones, then you actually have to make sure that different navigation regimes has to be applied, either internal water as a uh, territory sea as innocent passage or transit passage. So what is miserable for China and other countries is that we don't know, because when we talk about a shipping through the Arctic, mostly we talk about Northwest Passage, Northern Sea Route. So here, there's not a very clear understanding what is the legal state of this these two routes. So whether it's uh, internal water as Canada and Russia claim, or it's uh, international use for navigation as United States and the European Union will claim. So it's very interesting, different countries take different approach, like chi uh, US and Canada, they agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. But for Russia's case, and actually trying to uh, uh, issue a lot of uh, regulations in terms of merchant shipping. So in China's white paper, it's, it didn't mention, it mentioned about importance of Northwest Passage and Northern Sea Route, but it didn't, did not mention the legal status of these two passages doesn't want to challenge either country. Uh, so taking no position as US, taking no position in the South China Sea. So uh, I think, so what did, uh, what was mentioned in a white paper, I think China is trying to say that well, when non artists they were selling the Arctic to make sure we'll buy by treaties such as the Law of Sea Convention and Steeper Treaty, as well as general international law. But it did mention something not relevant to the law, but it did mention raise the concept of polar or ice silk road, which is something that maybe in later on we can discuss a little bit. That's about shipping. And the second is about resource development. China is certainly is interesting looking to opportunity. Uh, can we look, look to, I have only three slides. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh -oh. Thank you so much. So uh, it, it, because when China as a non artist state, when it wants to show interest in resource development in this region, let's take non-living resources as one example, and we have to make sure which area that we're talking about, whether we're talking about those areas within the national jurisdiction, or we're talking about the area uh, which is uh, authorized by Law's Convention under Article 136. So, and then the governing region of International Civil Authority. So right now the situation here is that I think all these states like Russia, Norway, Denmark, and Canada already submitted to the Commission on the Law Outer Limits of Continental Shelf Commission, but Canada hasn't actually submit the part of the Arctic issues. So, so far we have only recommendation from Norway and for Russia, the United States, because it has not ratified the Loves Convention. We don't know through which channel is going to do the same as other Arctic states. So, which means that we have to wait until the commission get back to all these countries and have a clear boundary where we're talking about the area or we're talking about uh, areas within all these countries in the station. So China and other, for instance, Japan, if they want to be involved in resource development, they have to cooperate with these artist states because we don't know it's too far to go to talk about like, engagement in the area. So I think in the white paper, China mentioned very clearly that China respects the sovereign rights of artist state over oil, gas, and mineral resource and uh, in the area subject to their jurisdiction in accordance with international law and also respect respected domestic law. So we're looking for instance, like Canada, it has a lot of domestic regulation in terms of oil and gas, like the 61 Canada Oil and Gas Resolution and 69 Oil and Gas Production Conservation. So, uh, so in terms of fishery and trying to support efforts to formulate a legal by the international engagement in the Arctic high sea portion. And 
I think I'm going to run my time. So China's interest in, in addition to shipping resource, it's more, I think, interest in the, resource, in the marine scientific research has started quite earlier, which means that it will follow very carefully that according to 245 and 246 of own cost, and when you conduct a scientific marine resource, they need permission from the coastal states. So I think I'm going to stop here, although I have other And we'll other pick Israel. it up. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for Q&A with yeah. the audience here. So thank you. Thank that you. was excellent. Thank Mark, you. over to you okay. on um, foreign direct investment. Right. Thank you. Actually, if I can get to the slides, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, s the, the title of this is Risks and Governance Gaps and Risks Associated with, with Current Arctic Development. Um, and I also like to acknowledge my colleague in the back, Shara Turinger, who was a co author of the FDI study on the right. Both of these uh, reports are readily available. Uh, on the web. And so I want to dive right in. The FDI report tries to follow the money. And um, this chart is a summary of what is explained in much greater detail in the report, which shows the penetration of the Arctic region um, as a case study looking at Chinese investment in the Arctic. Just a couple of notable things. Uh, I'll point out, look at Greenland on the far right. You can see that Chinese investment in the Greenland economy rec represents almost 12 percent of its GDP. And Iceland, it's nearly 6 percent. Uh, lesser, lesser sums for other countries, although Canada's it appears to be on the rise. Uh, now, this is for the countries as a whole, and unfortunately we couldn't break it out by investments north of 60 degrees. However, as you can see at the bottom, Investments above 60 degree north is now approaching $90 billion in a whole host of, of projects in terms of China, you know, uh, infrastructure, oil and gas, uh, finance, et cetera, et cetera. So why do we care about FDI? Well, money is power. And so the question is, will some, will large amounts of money going into projects in the Arctic result in a country losing its autonomy or its sovereignty to make its own decisions because it's captured by its investors. The second, or on the darker side of FDI, and Elizabeth Economy at the Council on Foreign Relations did an excellent book on this, um, is that will the right kind of standards be brought to bear? Um, you know, are there st will there sta be standards to p that are sustainable to protect the interests of local inhabitants as well as to protect the, the, uh, the, 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 the environment because most of what will come to the Arctic will come by water or come by sea and most of the development that will occur in the Arctic will likely come, uh, will, will occur near the water because there's, you know, there, with some exceptions there's no pipelines, there's no airports, there's no, no railroads, et cetera, et cetera. And so the sea is the common bond. And so you worry about a project like an oil and gas project, an offshore rig in which, in which state-of-the-art standards are not being applied. In terms of some of the types of activities that are going here, I mean, this is just a, just a very brief snapshot, but money is going in there. There are lots of resource projects, basically in three groups, mining, oil, and, and also, um, also uh, natural gas. Um, in what are the, lo the long-term projections? Natural gas is here, and it's commercially viable. The Yamal Peninsula is a massive, it's, it's a collection of, of five major oil fields and gas fields, and um, there is now export of LNG to markets both in, in mostly in Asia. Um, but also there's extensive amounts of mining. Why do you worry about mining? Well, what happens when the vein runs dry? Who's going to pay the decommissioning costs? Because, again, it's likely to occur near the water, and you have this potential for leaching into the, into the water column. You also have some offshore oil and gas. There's a picture, I won't even attempt to pronounce it, of a Russian oil rig, which is in the bloody middle of nowhere. It's 1,000 kilometers from its nearest port. It's in the western Barents Sea. So, question is, what happens if you have a problem there? Because most of the oil is brought up and is stored in this caisson uh, device that's under, the, uh, that's under the actual drilling platform. So what happens if you have an incident? How are you going to clean it up? Is this particular activity adequately secured? Is there enough insurance? Shipping 
with mining, with oil and gas, comes ships, because that's the only way you're going to get it out of there. And so you can see there have been uh, there, there have been tankers that have gone through there, not with great regularity, but the numbers are slightly increasing. The middle one shows a proof of concept, a Costco uh, proof of concept involving a container ship, Chinese flag. I worry about that as a former naval officer because what happens when there's icing on the top? You know, you, you have a situation, unless the ship is ex very well designed, where the thing can become unstable. Lastly, this is a state-of-the-art LNG carrier. It's Russian-owned, uh, Cypriot-flagged, and, and it supports the Yamal LNG project, um, which is uh, financed by Russia, as by fi Russia, China, and, uh, and France. I mean, it's, it's a state-of-the-art. It can eat a uh, uh, tanker, LNG tanker, can even break ice. Problem is it went through the Northern Sea Route without an escort. So what, it, what does that mean long term? If, if you have an accident. You're going to go to a Cyprus court to sue somebody? It, it's concerning. What are the current risk trajectories? And this is, this is an amalgamation from the two report, from both of the reports, the one that we did at Stanford, the Hoover Institute, as well as the CNA report. There are no legal agreements to address liability for offshore accidents. And the regulatory authorities, the ability of the coastal states to regulate what happens outside of vis-a-vis -vis shipping is quite limited under Article 234 because of rights of, you know, innocent passage and transit passage and so forth and so on. The Polar Code, people often say the Polar Code is great. The problem is it, it needs to be implemented and implementation is based on the responsibilities of the flag states. And all flag states are not, con uh, are not equal in terms of their approaches to enforcement. The liability and the IMO instruments, namely, what about tankers? If you have a tanker accident where a tanker runs aground, how's the cleanup going to be paid for? Or is it going to be a jump ball where all the countries sit around a table and point fingers at one another and pass the plate? The reality is, is that the IMO instruments, in my judgment, are clearly deficient if you look at how much it would cost to respond to and clean up after a major incident. Land-based activities. Remember, so each country has a sovereign right to develop its own resources. And so the question is, remember, this is occurring near the Arctic Sea, Arctic Ocean, which is a closed sea. And so the question is, what happens if there's something affecting the water column? There's nothing to deal with that. And also, the remoteness of the place can lead to a problem. There's been some activity, there, there were some oil spills, I believe it was in the Komi region in Russia, where the, the spill was going on for long, an extremely long period of time before anybody really discovered it because the place is so barren and remote. Um, there are no reciprocal development standards, which means, you know, just basic economics. The money's going to go to the place where the standards are the most lax. And lastly, getting to FDI, there are no standards whatsoever. And it's, okay, am I over? 26. Yeah. Seven minutes. Okay. <laughs> there are no regional standards, and states are very, are very, um, the states do not regulate FDI in the same way. And also, the, the, the data that we have, particularly when it comes to Russia and FDI that's occurring within Russia, is uh, it's a black box. It's very difficult to get a handle on those, uh, on what's happening there. I'll leave off the recommendations. You can see those in the report. Thank you, Mark. Now, now you see why he's such an excellent lawyer and analyst, because he is so excellent, Mark, at identifying the risks uh, and potential liabilities that we may not yet have thought of. Thank you, Mark. That was excellent. Um, Mark Nevitt, you've just written this very interesting um, uh, law review piece, Polar Opposites, Assessing the State of Environmental Law in the World's Polar Regions. Uh, can your, your article compares what you call the hard law system of the Antarctic Treaty system with the soft law system of the Arctic Council. Break that down a little bit for us. Why, what is it? Why does it matter? And um, what is your, this concept of global environmental law that you write about in your piece? Great. Thanks, Sherry, and thanks, Hong, and, and Mark, for your remarks. I think many of my remarks will serve as sort of friendly amendments to, to what everything you said and I promised the audience I did not share my remarks with them ahead of time, but you'll see a constant vein through my discussion. Um, I want to highlight just four key factors that I believe will have an outsized impact on the Arctic 
and its legal national security and environment. And I'll tie that into the Arctic Treaty System, which is very much a hard law treaty system that's been in place, entered into force since 1961, and has been kind of a remarkable international environmental law success story. Um, the first thing about the Arctic that is interesting is that its geography is just so unique. Its geography may very well be its destiny when you compare and contrasting these two legal regimes. Fundamentally, it's an ocean that's surrounded by land, unlike Antarctica, which is a land surrounded by the ocean. But in terms of size of the land mass of Antarctica, it's basically the same size as the Arctic Ocean, about 5.5 million square miles. And it has very similar environmental, very similar challenges with the climate that are also affecting both polar regions. The Arctic, though, is somewhat like an orange in the sense of you have five coastal states whose stems all um, sort of reach the high north with their continental shelves. It's unlike any place on the earth, unlike Antarctica, which is really truly a land without a sovereign. And that brings me to my next point. The geopolitics of the Arctic versus Antarctica are actually quite, quite different. And when I think of the Arctic, I think of sort of three key numbers. For me, the first number is eight. That number eight refers to the, um, the Arctic uh, Council voting members. Um, Denmark, Russia, United States, Norway, Canada, Finland, Iceland, and Sweden. It's very much a closed voting member group. China, Hong, did recently receive accredited uh, observer status. But it is not sort of um, an Arctic Council full member in the sense that it cannot drive the agenda, it cannot serve as a cheer of the Arctic Council. So it's sort of on the outside, sort of looking in. Different from Antarctica, where you had 43 to 45 nations come together uh, to, to develop this Antarctic treaty system. Indeed, in the Arctic, there's, there's significantly more oil and gas, natural resources that are there. The, but although Antarctica does have some significant mineral resources, that has been um, part of the Antarctic treaty system. The second number is five, and that refers to the Arctic coastal states, Denmark, Russia, the United States, Norway, and Canada, which serves as sort of a, a subset of the Arctic Council. That's significant because they can actually make claims on the continental shelf with one sort of caveat. Four, which is only four of the five Arctic coastal states, are signatories parties to the UN Convention on Law of the Sea. So they can't take advantage of the adjudicatory provisions that, that Hong mentioned and Mark mentioned, which is really the commission on the limits on the continental shelf. So the United States is sort of cannot make a uh, claim off the coast of Alaska to that valuable seabed and, and, and subsoil. The other reason why the number four is important is because four of the Ar five Arctic states are NATO members. We look at a map of the Arctic, which we have here, approximately half of it is Russia. The other four uh, nations, which are Arctic coastal states, are NATO members. And that's, re that's really relevant to the Arctic Council because it specifically does not discuss matters of military security. The Antarctic Treaty System actually addressed this head on. People forget, but the Antarctica was very much a Cold War hotspot. In the 1950s, in the Cold War, there was discussion of nuclear testing in Antarctica, and uh, the U.S. military is actually quite active in Antarctica. But it addressed the issue of military head-on in its treaty system, and it's been a remarkable place of peace and security. The last number reason why four is important is because four million people live north of the Arctic Circle. <laughs> so inherently, it's a harder problem as a legal matter based upon the geography and based upon the number of people who live there. The, second, the, the, the third major point I'll, I'll talk to is that the Arctic region is inherently a soft law legal governance system. The work of the Arctic Council has evolved as an environmental uh, initiative started in 1991, and it sort of has evolved organically uh, within the council members. And it has indeed uh, started to address matters that have begun to look like binding agreements. The search and rescue agreement, uh, the Marine Oil P Pollution Preparedness and Response Agreement. So the Arctic Council has shown an ability to sort of evolve with the, with the uh, evolving trends of the times. But again, there are limitations of the Arctic Council in the sense that it is fundamentally a soft law legal governance system. You can leave the Arctic Council, President Trump could leave the Arctic Council uh, fairly easily if he wanted to, unlike the durability of the Antarctic Treaty System, which uh, secedes administrations and has a certain viability continuum continual beyond the politics. 
So there's less enforcement, obviously, of the Arctic Council's conventions. The last point, uh, the fourth point I'll make is this notion of climate change. Climate change is fundamentally changing the Antarctica, re the Antarctic region, and the Arctic in ways, if we're really being honest with ourselves, we don't fully understand. Sherry is absolutely correct to mention uh, the impact of climate change in the Arctic is twice considered uh, for the rest of the world, uh, twice as uh, pronounced as the rest of the world, and about a 13% decrease in uh, Arctic ice sheet melting per decade. But there's other things that are happening right now that we don't fully understand in both Ar the Arctic and Antarctica, which had an ice shelf the size of Delaware break off in the fall, which is based upon the albedo effect and scientific effects, which create a feedback loop. We don't have, because of access, the really solid scientific research needed to fully address what is going on um, in the uh, climate change space in the Arctic. Um, and there's this notion in science called stationarity, and that system sort of fluctuate within sort of a envelope, a, uh, a unchanging envelope of variability. Uh, that's been considered dead in the water management context because climate change is that ultimate factor, the X factor, which is blowing away all their future environmental models. The last point I'll conclude on this point, which is Mark's point about Greenland. If you want to look for a, a nation or a, a, a landmass, which is Greenland is technically an autonomous constituent country within the kingdom of Denmark, sort of the canary in the coal mine for all these issues, I think it's Greenland. You have Chinese investment. There's 60,000 people in Greenland. There's a uh, movement and tension between the kingdom of Denmark uh, which is very much a strong uh, NATO ally, an original NATO ally. There's a military base in um, Tool Air Force Base in Greenland. And there's a tension that's emerging with uh, Chinese investment in three airports and mineral extraction, which is sort of a boon to the economy for the local Greenlanders. Many of them are, are, are much poorer than uh, uh, people who reside in Denmark. And so the, the fundamental question, I think, to look at is how the Chinese involvement in Greenland looks and, you know, People have discussed that Greenland may indeed be the first nation born from climate change. We shall see that if that happens in our lifetime. I'll conclude there. I just think that climate change will impact the geography, the geopolitics, and it will stress the legal regimes of the Arctic in ways we don't fully understand. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was really excellent. Um, I'd like to invite now Ambassador Bolton to come and share a few remarks with us, if you'd like, here at the podium. Sure. Uh, Ambassador Bolton, you have been part of the evolution of Arctic governance now uh, for several decades. Share with us um, some of your reflections on that arc of evolution, and uh, how do you think it's going to evolve in the next decade? Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Sherry. Thanks to uh, your uh, three speakers. I think what I'd like to do, Sherry, is just offer a comment and a question to each one of them by way of um, perhaps uh, revealing some of my own thinking about this. Uh, to Dr. Nung, uh, you said uh, correctly, of course, that it took China somewhat longer than some of the other uh, Asian states who recently became Arctic Council observers to put out uh, a new strategy. And you pointed out, I think rightly, that in many ways China's interest in the Arctic um, are not so different from those of, say, Japan and South Korea. But it's interesting, right, that China's strategy has attracted a great deal more attention than those of the others, and I think it's mm. obvious why, that China is in some ways not like Japan and South <laughs> Korea. They're one of the two largest economies in the world, and they're investing heavily mm. in places in the Arctic, as Mark Rosen pointed out. So the question I have for you is, why? Why is there so much more attention on Arctic, Arctic, uh, China's Arctic interests? Is it because they tried to use the terminology of the Polar Silk Road and link their Arctic ambitions to the Belt and Road Initiative? Is there a sense, in your view, that China is trying to um, remake the Arctic in its own image? That's the question for you. Mark, uh, thank you very much, uh, both for your, your pieces, which I read, and the presentation today. Um, the one stat that leapt out at me, of the many that you put up on the screen, was the uh, Chinese foreign direct investment in Greenland, which if I caught it correctly, amounts to almost 12% of Greenlandic 
GDP. Did I get that right? But my question to you is, it's a little below. It's yeah, a little lower than that, but it's high. Between 11 and 12 percent, perhaps. The question I have for you is, what is the trend line, though? I had the impression that um, it was actually higher a little while ago when the price of oil and gas was high and may have actually been decreasing lately. I'm just wondering whether you know about that or where okay. we could look for an answer to that. Uh, Mark Nevitt, thank you very much for your presentation. I certainly agree with you that the geopolitics of the two polar regions are really quite different. I did want to make one friendly amendment to your presentation. I happen to know that, at least from the perspective of the U.S. government, it is not necessary to be a party to the Law of the Sea Convention to have continental shelf, indeed to have continental shelf beyond 200 miles, I'm sure. And it's not clear, nobody's tried it yet, whether a submission to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf by a non-party would succeed. It's an open question, it mm -hmm. certainly, and I wonder whether you agree with that. But the real question I had for you is more about the soft law, hard law distinction. It is certainly true that the Antarctic Treaty system is sort of quintessentially a hard law system. The Antarctic Treaty is an actual treaty, and the, that the Arctic Council is based not on a treaty but on a on the Ottawa Declaration, and yet in the last seven years, we have seen, by my count, five legally binding things for the Arctic come of age. You mentioned two of them, the Search and Rescue Agreement, mm -hmm. the Arctic Marine Oil Pollution Agreement, the Arctic Science Agreement signed last mm -hmm. summer, the Polar Shipping Code coming out of the IMO, not an Arctic Council thing, mm -hmm. and a new Arctic Fisheries Agreement not yet mm -hmm. signed. In your view, are we looking at a move, perhaps more than you were suggesting, toward a hard law system for the Arctic? And should we? Should we be heading in that direction? Those are my questions. Thanks very much. That, that was terrific, Dave. And I see we're going to have to have a whole other program where you get you <laughs> on the question that I actually ask you. <laughs> but you've just... Uh, it, you know, displayed your excellent diplomatic skills. Okay, um, let's see. I, I'm actually going to let you all think about those answers to those questions for a minute and give Lindsay an opportunity to come up here and share with us your um, work now in Canada, your reflections, if you will, on Canada's um, evolving Arctic policy. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I will actually answer the question because as a Marine, I'm going to follow orders. Um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me. It's actually a real honor to be on this stage with the uh, very distinguished panel. So thank you. Um, as Sherry mentioned, I've actually had the real fortunate opportunity to work a little bit with the Canadian government on their new Arctic strategy. And uh, I want to, as an attorney, I need to do the standard disclaimer. I am certainly not speaking on behalf of the Canadian government or giving you a sense of what they intend to decide or anything like that. These are just my own personal observations. Um, Canada's relationship to its Arctic is, is pretty distinct from the U.S. Um, as an Arctic nation, they take their responsibility towards the Arctic people of Canada. Uh, very seriously, and uh, um, I know we have at least one Alaskan in the room, and I want to make sure that uh, we sort of uh, acknowledge the fact that in the U.S. we often run to the geopolitics of the Arctic without actually acknowledging the fact that our moral authority to take on a leadership position in the Arctic has to do with the fact that we have people living in the Arctic as well in, in Alaska. Um, that's something that sort of becomes an afterthought when we think about the Arctic, but in Canada it is the primary political issue when it comes to Arctic matters. And so this summer, uh, at some point, probably more like the fall, Canada is going to come out with a new Arctic strategy, and it's going to include both do domestic and international dimensions. Um, it, is, uh, it is a people-first strategy, and it's actually being co-developed with indigenous groups of the north. Uh, that term co-development is not actually defined uh, by either party, so that's um, created a little bit of political tension uh, in terms of raising expectations and what the federal government really means about co-developing its Arctic strategy with indigenous groups of the north. Um, but it's a whole new government approach to uh, creating priorities for the region. It grows out of Prime Minister Trudeau's broader reconciliation agenda, and that was a campaign promise that he made in 2015. He's very, a very important issue to him is a rights and reconciliation 
framework approach to the relationship between Canada and its Indigenous people. As you can tell even from the vocabulary that I'm using, the way that Canada talks about these issues is just completely different from how the United States approaches some of these matters. I think in the United States there's a lot we could learn from it, um, but uh, I would I say the one sort of negative aspect to all of this, probably for the folks in the room, is that this domestic component is so important in Canada that um, the ambitions of this document to satisfy both domestic and international questions, uh, those international questions may actually be um, sort of sublimated to the priority that's being given to the domestic. So as much as uh, many of us, I think, would like to see Canada come out as a leader on some of these global and international issues, and maybe put some money towards its priorities on the international stage, especially when it comes to issues like climate change, it's not obvious to me that we're going to see that because the needs of Canadian people in the North, including the fact that it's a very infrastructure poor area, um, and there are issues like uh, poor access to health. There's actually tuberculosis in Nunavut, which when we think about the first world seems sort of unthinkable. Um, those types of priorities are really going to get the, pri the majority of the funding. And um, Sherry asked me uh, privately earlier, I'm going to share, whether um, there will be sufficient funding to meet the vast requirements of the North, uh, both internationally and domestically, in this new Canadian strategy. And I don't know the answer to that, to be perfectly candid. Um, but uh, what I understand just from reading in the news is that uh, it's probably not going to be sufficient to meet those domestic needs. And each of the territories in the Canadian North are actually looking to China um, as a major investor. I know the Northwest Territories and Nunavut have developed their own diplomatic subnational relationship with China, trying to uh, get more of their investment there. So that's a, um, an interesting development as we think about China's influence in North America, both in Greenland, as mentioned, and in Canada. Um, La did you want me to touch on the Northwest Passage too, or have I run out of time? Um, very briefly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in Canada, um, on the international stage, they have this notion of sovereignty that we don't really use in the United. We don't use that term that well, that way. Um, and their uh, this notion of sovereignty really takes over how they think about their north. So if you look at that map, you'll see that the Canadian Arctic Archipelago is really the the land that we're talking about. Um, now, what they've done is they've drawn a big triangle over the top of that and said that everything south of that is internal waters. Um, and so, therefore, they have the authority to regulate and, to act and that no one can actually pass through those waters without their permission. The United States position, the position of the European Union and some other countries as well, is that that it lies in contravention to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, Canada has actually framed this question as a U.S. versus Canada issue, and that's primarily because the U.S. is the only real vocal state in opposition to it, but other states have also come out against that. Now, we might not care because we know that our relationship with Canada is nice enough that, you know, if we ask permission, they'll always let us through, and we have this agreement to disagree, so it's not a big deal. Uh, the, the problem, perhaps, is that that position is very consistent with Russia's position with respect to the straits over their landmass in between their islands and, th and their mainland. Um, and they have also been passing laws. Um, so Canada has northern regulations, these Nord regs, that um, anyone who passes through have to abide by. And Russia, very similarly, has been passing legislation trying to create regulations for anyone who might want to pass through the Northern Sea Route, including, most recently, issues like only Russian flag vessels can go through the Northern Sea Route, which, again, would be in contravention of the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea from the U.S. perspective. So the fact that Canada and Russia are aligned on that front is another reason that the U.S. probably uh, might want to think through its, uh, it, how vocal it is in terms of its opposition to that stance. Thank you. Thanks. That was that was excellent, excellent, Lindsay. Okay, I'd like to ask our panelists now um, to respond, particularly to Ambassador Bolton's questions or anything else that Lindsay said, and then I want we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Okay, so I was uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your question. I think that's a very good one. My my reaction is two points. First of all, I think with Chinese economic and military growth. And it's easy to make a big headlines, <laughs> even though it's many of their strategies or frameworks in white paper, I think raise more positive comments there and than expected actually. So I think uh, I think there will I think people's concern about Chinese like policy in the RT also based on previously uh, from 2013 until 20, 
seventeen in China, many there are many irresponsible or lack of professional comments about Chinese role in the art. For instance, we often hear people comment, "Well, China is a near art state. It's nothing wrong," but but it gives uh, people impression that China want to do something by picture itself as near art state. But even in this white paper, it still used that near art state role, but more emphasized more as a stakeholder. So I think. That's one reason, and even I remember there was a while when some retired journalists from PLA, they trying to picture talking about the art as the area for common use. And that actually very, sent a very alerting message to countries like Europe, not US, maybe the United States doesn't care too much about the Arctic at this moment, I think, like Canada and Russia. They're very concerned about this kind of statement. So I think China has to take some responsibility of sending those misleading and unprofessional message. And the second point you're talking about, because in this white paper, China wants to like, interpret the development on the uh, uh, shipping or infrastructure facility construction in the framework of BRI. I think that's something raised uh, receive a lot of attention because there is due some uh, ambiguity, for instance, on what whether Chinese strategy or BRI is more on economic or more strategy in order for fuel strategy to go in the world. So I think you are absolutely right pointing to this one. By talking about the polar silk road in the front of BRI, that actually make this white paper receive more attention compared with Japan and South Korea. Um, thanks for your question, Dave. Um, what's the trend line? Well, the report that we did represents a snapshot in time, and it did show progressive increases in the case, and, and I went back and checked, it was nearly 12 percent. Um, one of the difficulties is, is that reporting is not uniform in terms of projects, and so we had some proprietary sources as well as the Internet. And uh, we checked with uh, like chambers of commerce and other types of sources, um, and we kind of monitor them. So I can't tell you today. My gut tells me that the uh, is is that the trend continues. Uh, some of the major things that I've noticed in the last three or four months is something called the Data Silk Road, which is a major project that is involves a, a consortium between China and uh, entities within Finland to, to string a, string's the wrong word, to lay an undersea cable that basically goes the length of a northern sea route. It's going to be an enormously costly project. Also, Mark mentioned the airport projects that China is doing inside of, of uh, Greenland. I don't know all the particulars. And then also there's been a lot of wide reporting that China is interested in perhaps developing infrastructure along the Northwest Passage. So my gut tells me that the, uh, there, will, there is increased interest and actual money going into projects. I think also why, you know, you sort of sit back, why, the, why did China release its Arctic policy? Well, I think part of it was to also, you know, it has, it uses the word cooperation and very non-confrontational type language. Part of that I think may have been to reassure the countries up there that, hey, what we're bringing to the table is, is, is not to be regarded as threatening. So, but I, I do think that the money's continuing to go in and then the trend line is, is, uh, it continues to go. Oil and gas, the demand signal is positive. For oil, or excuse me, for gas, it's positive. Oil, I mean, oil's what, nearly $70 a barrel. So it, at some point, you know, if it continues to go up, then it may become economically viable. But certainly for minerals and gas, the trend, you know, the, the market forces are there. Mark? Uh, thanks, Mark. I'll be very brief. Um, on, on the question of the commission on the limits of the continental shelf, there's a fundamental question about the legal effect of their rulings and their findings right now for unclossed parties. And so if the United States were to submit a um, submission to the commission, I think it would be viewed with even a lower legal, um, legally binding uh, factor, viewed even uh, you know, much, much less, uh, because the fundamentals of that adjudicatory body's rulings are un unclear. 
I think if the United States was, if I had a perfect world, if I was king for a day, <laughs> the United States would, would uh, Senate would provide its advice consent to the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, and the following day they should submit a CLCS commission. Um, because what we didn't mention is where the ice is melting. The ice is melting north of the Bering Sea in disproportionate numbers. So that's in the, uh, the Alaska's continental shelf between the United States and Russia. If we're playing the long game, we would submit that commission uh, now uh, for the five coastal states have already done that. We have not. Finally, in the Arctic Council, I, I agree with you, the Arctic Treaty is unlikely. The Arctic Council should still do what, keep doing what it's doing. It's five quasi-legal binding um, uh, agreements are, are a positive step. And I did, I've talked about the negative aspects of not having a binding treaty, but there's also very positive aspects. And this goes along with the notion of global environmental law. The Arctic Council has lower barriers to entry. Indigenous people can be part of the conversation. Their, view, their viewpoint's critical. They live there, right? We don't. Um, uh, observer status. The, the Arctic Council can grow and evolve and increase observer status. So there's certain flexibility and um, just uh, ability to kind of bring in new members and have, bring in new voices that a hard law treaty system just doesn't have. Terrific. Uh, that was that was excellent. Okay. I'd now like to uh, open the uh, open the floor to questions. And I um, see some hands going up. We'll start uh, these two right here, and then we'll go to the two in the back. Okay, if you could please introduce yourself as well. Uh, Peter Humphrey. I'm an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. Um, I'm intrigued to see China with an icebreaker, and we're supposing that they're going to add polar capabilities to their submarines. And, you know, Russia and China are good drinking buddies, but whoa, this, this starts to get into Russia's turf, you know. And so I'm wondering sort of if any of you can shed insight onto the Russian reactions to these Chinese developments. And, and, uh, and secondarily, none of us mentioned methane clathrates, which is mm. huge. Uh, and I can easily see the Chinese who care nothing for how much it costs to develop something just to get your hands on it, being out front on the methane clathrate front even before Japan or Russia. Should we go ahead? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think my a personal opinion, and we talked about this in the report, I think that Russia is wary of Chinese investment, but it's the only game in town, and they really want to develop their resources, and sanctions have pushed the U.S. further and further away from that. Um, I know France is, is a player, and India is a player in, in projects along the Yamal Peninsula. But I, I, you know, I think the, you know, Chinese money from the Russian perspective is the only game in town, and they're going to play that hand. I would also add rare earth minerals to your list, uh, especially in Greenland, where you want to get. I mean, you know, if you if you have a cartel or a monopoly, you can charge monopoly rents. So I, I would add that to the list. Can I also add to that? I think. Russia's reaction to China's investment or engagement in the Arctic varies from time to time, depending on the bilateral relations. I think China has gone through a very difficult time from 2008 until 2013 when it met, finally got uh, the status because due to objections somehow from Canada and Russia. But lately, I think because the bilateral relationship is improving, and then we see that like, Russia's more welcoming Chinese investment as uh, Mark mentioned, but also like even their president Putin like make a very official statement calling for Russia and China engage more cooperation in the Arctic, not only on the oil and gas fields, but also on the shipping, for instance, infrastructure facility. So there's ongoing discussion and that the two countries should work together, for instance, to select some very important ports, which might be very important for oil and gas development and for the future shipping within Russia's territory. I think the on discussion is going on there. So I see that like a back and forth depending on the political and security framework and atmosphere. Hi, good morning. I'm a student from UC Santa Barbara. I have a question about like, so with the increasing um, investment in the Arctic like these days, like with the shipping and the oil and natural gas, so how do you keep a balance between like 
preserving the uh, nature and the environment of Arctic and um, to preserve balance and the investment. Because like uh, the melting of the Arctic is a big issue like in the 21st century. So like I, I want to hear about your opinions about it. Okay, I think we're gonna take we'll take a couple questions now. Thank you. Okay, let's let's just go this line, this gentleman here in the white shirt, and then uh, and then we'll take the next two uh, people after after we answer. Thank you very much, Brian Muling at US EPA. Um, I'd like to try to weave a few threads together and hopefully get Ambassador Bolton or Mr. Rosen or others to weigh in if possible. Um, I just returned from Toronto where I chaired the Arctic Contaminants Action Program Working Group mm. Short-Lived Climate Pollutants Expert Group meeting. The ACAP is one of the Arctic Council Working Groups. And I would note that Denmark, Iceland, and Russia were not present for the meeting, the discussion on short-lived climate pollutants, where we're talking about things like um, mitigating emissions from diesel used in airports, ports, ships, often on-road trucks and whatnot. <coughs> um, we have project proposals pending before international financial institutions to do work on APG flaring, shipping, and um, the use of HFCs and seafood processing facilities in Russia and are on hold um, per decision of the Russian government. I respect that. And the fact is that we're all sitting around twiddling our thumbs wondering, well, what can we do? So we're looking at and agreeing with one another, we need to initiate projects in our own countries, despite the fact that most of the funds available to us right now are really meant to be used in Russia. So I'd like to just put out the possibility that the governments of China, Singapore, Korea, and Japan look at the opportunity to engage with us as Arctic Council observer nations and invite us to work with them in Greenland, for example, to assure that the projects that they're putting into place are clean and green and as sustainable as they can be so as to minimize the adverse consequences for the climate, the local environment, and whatnot. I would assert, personally speaking, that that might be something that both the contaminants part of the Arctic Council infrastructure as well as the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program would greatly welcome because it would help us both better quantify current and potential future emissions of these pollutants, given current and projected economic activity, but it will also help us better mitigate it. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay, those two questions obviously tie together. Uh, can we have an answer? And then we're going to take the last three questions, one, two, three, after that. Okay. Yep. Um, I'll try to answer both questions. That, that may be a fool's errand. But I totally agree with you. And I didn't get to show my last slide, which contains some recommendations. And, and if you look in the, F, the CNA FDI report, there are some. I think the key is you need a development code. I called it an Arctic development code, which establishes some reciprocal standards so you don't have breakout in one state or another where money's going to go to the place where the regulatory burden is the lightest. The other thing I think which is really, really key is that uh, I'd rec we recommended that you needed an Arctic Development Bank so that you provide an alternative source of funding, and along with that would include some development standards. So those, I think, trying to use market principles is probably the best way to find the balance. It, it also addresses what you were asking. You know, I think that your 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 question. I just answered this question real briefly. That that's that's that is the most important question. It's just the environment, the fragility, the harsh conditions. <laughs> it's hard to really explain in this comfortable environment just how harsh and brutal the conditions are up in the Arctic region. So that's why the Arctic Council's work, which is fundamentally an environmental protection work uh, that they do, is just so fundamental. But I don't think we're ready. If there was some sort of massive disaster, environmental disaster. In, in that area, whether it be an oil shipping problem or oil, um, just to get access to that um, shipping container or that oil spill, it could have enormous environmental, uh, uh, it could be disastrous. Okay, let's take uh, these two questions and the one over here, and then we'll close it out. 
Bobby I'm run a few minutes late. Thank uh, you. Pestron Glass. I notice on the the map in back of you that there are certain portions of the Arctic that are labeled as unclaimed. Why is that, and what's the significance of that? Thank you. Good morning. I'm Annie Kayaban Wilderman, a Filipino American, and uh, a 24 civilian engineer for the U.S. Navy, and founder and CEO of Xiopao, Xiopao for Peace and Development. Not necessarily a question, but to thank you for this forum and platform, because it has given us a very, very far lens with which to implement and develop initiatives within the context of EDCA, the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement between the United States and the Philippines, mm. which has become very controversial. We have uh, an uh, anticipated and, and going on, people are mobilizing to riot, objecting to it, because this is just an excuse for the presence of the Americans to be in the Philippines, vis-a-vis -vis the bases in the Philippines. And so this platform, <coughs> it's giving us peace, you know, initiatives with which to countermand this. You have mentioned sovereignty, you have mentioned environmental impact because the infrastructure that China built underneath or near one of our big islands destroyed coral reefs. Very, very unique corals. Again, I thank you. Thank you. Okay, last question, Elizabeth. Hi. Uh, well, uh, the Wilson Center. Yes. <laughs> With the China Environment Forum at the Wilson Center. Um, I was interested in, Lindsay, you had brought up the fact that in Canada and Greenland and then also in Russia um, throughout the Arctic, there's been a lot of Chinese investment, um, especially to bolster um, kind of issues that they're trying to address. Um, and I was wondering where you all see this Chinese investment being able to indirectly influence um, what's going on in the Arctic Council since there's so much investment. and how the U.S. Um, not necessarily b being involved in these investments um, is can change or how the U.S. should get involved. Okay, great set of uh, closing questions for our speakers. I'll speak to the unclaimed piece first. I think it just highlights two things. One is the exclusive economic zone, which is 200 nautical miles. That's that's the that's the surface waters over uh, beyond the, the the coastal state. Um, that's easy to figure out. That's that's just a flat number. Um, what's more complicated is the continental shelf's uh, natural prolongation, in the in the in the words of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. That is much more difficult to, to claim. So I think what's happening here is a couple sort of little holes in the Arctic donut holes or sort of little spots, jigsaw puzzles, where the natural prolongation is not is not there and that uh, continental shelf is, is not claimed. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I think China investment in the Arctic not only rely on shipping or oil and gas, and it's also spent a lot of uh, discussion, also input on uh, marine scientific research and also um, technology cooperation like with uh, Iceland, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. That is where we see the most recent in 2013, there is like Nordic Research Res Institute together with five uh, research institutes from these other states uh, were established in Shanghai. So the invest people normally were focused when they talk about investment, they only talk about oil and gas, but there's a lot of other activity that China, China has been devoted to. In terms of your question, whether through the investment and China is going to influence uh, increase the influence of Arctic, I don't think so, because China is a non-Arctic, even though it's an observer, it has no uh, voting right. And uh, it's there to sitting and listen to discussion, hoping to have his voice being heard on a lot of issues, including environment issues they've been talking about. The one slide I haven't got a chance to present it in my, uh, to my talk, actually, in a white paper, China 
I focus quite a lot on calling for environmental sustainability, working together with these uh, also indigenous people, taking into consideration the needs of indigenous people as well. So I would encourage that when I'm looking at non artist states' interest, it should be like having an overall picture rather than only the investment itself. Um, to your question here on the left, um, in the report, we actually came down, uh, the Arctic Council, going back to what Mark said, it's a soft law um, entity. Also, you have, the, you have observers. I mean, I think, frankly, a multilateral agreement is the best approach among the states, and that multilateral agreement would establish standards for FDI, you know, which are based on what's the nature of the project, does the host country have the ability to regulate it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it, it would, I think it would be best ad approached on a multilateral um, a, a basis. And I, then again, I pound on the table that a multilateral approach to an Arctic Development Bank, because if you can provide alternative sources of funding along with lending conditions, that frankly is going to be a lot quicker to put into place than trying to broker standards, you know, among six different countries that have their own different legal traditions and so forth. So. That's, but the Arctic Council, I don't think, is currently equipped to do that. Okay, I want to thank our uh, panelists and our discussants today. It's been uh, a very rich and interesting discussion. When I, when I was a young lawyer, I thought the field of international law was sort of not that interesting <laughs> compared to what was happening in global security during the Cold War, nuclear weapons and arms control. But I'll tell you, my views have really changed. I think that there's a convergence in these areas now. The forefront of what we might call maritime environmental security uh, is coming together with the field of global environmental law as we see uh, new regions emerge with both new legal uh, theories and understandings to underpin the new geopolitics of the era. So thank you all for joining us this morning and let's give our speakers a round of applause.